tiny little room, but I am in Bristol and it's nice and cool today. Not too hot, not too hot. Just got back from the jog walk, actually. Uh, and also joining us today on the show from, from somewhere that's climatologically not that different. At least it wasn't yesterday when it was all foggy here uh, to San Francisco, Mr. Mark Geller, who has owned for many years a Toyota RAV4 EV. How are you today, Mark? Good, thank you, Nikki. And now, hello, Dominic. Now, Mark, you have hey, Mark. owned uh, you've owned a, a number of uh, electric vehicles over the years. Uh, you had a Think City. Uh, you have your RAV4 EV. You now have a uh, a Nissan Leaf as well. Uh, and you spend your days these days uh, working for Adopt a Charger. Tell us about that. Well, Adopt a Charger is a nonprofit that's uh, basically uh, feels that the most important thing at the moment charging is to get charging out there um, that people can simply use without any complications in order to really stimulate sales of EVs as well as to provide uh, charging in locations that the commercial operations don't seem to be, be uh, meeting the need for, uh, particularly at the moment parks, right. uh, parks in, across the country, but most, uh, most specifically parks in California. Okay, so um, and there's some there's a fantastic photograph of you online at the moment, actually holding up your little charging station and giving it a bit of a hug. I've seen that one; it's very nice. Uh, but I mean, so if somebody adopts a charger, uh, talk me through the process of adopting a charger. Does that mean they get like you know, like you know, like when you get these um, uh, things through the mail where they offer you to sponsor a child in? Nicaragua or some other country and they send you little progress reports about how the child's doing or the goat <laughs> you sponsor a goat and send it to Africa Is it, do you get little progress updates from your charging station if you adopt a charger? well it, it hasn't worked out quite like that I think the initial hope was that we would find um, large sponsors for specific specific locations and and often that is what has happened um, I think uh, we still hope that we'll get some uh, sponsorship from from you know, uh, automotive uh, partners, and we've gotten some of that. Um, but it has been a tough road to hoe getting sponsorship. Uh, it's not a cheap process to put in a charging station. Um, so at the moment, we're actually working both with sponsors, nonprofit sponsors and corporate sponsors in some cases, but also we have applied for and received a, a pretty good-sized grant from the state of California uh, to do the work at the uh, parks both the state parks and the national parks. So uh, we're, we're going full steam ahead, putting uh, charging stations in parks on uh, this grant from the state and with partners such as Indian tribes in Northern California, uh, utilities uh, in Southern California. Uh, and, uh, you know, so it's, it's basically been putting together a jigsaw puzzle in order to get the funding to, to right. put these right. simple, dumb chargers in where people want to use them. Now, it's a very interesting thing because I don't know if you've, you've suffered this problem uh, in the US. I, I think you have because I remember us chatting about this in the past. Here in the UK, very often what happens is, uh, or in Europe, in the wider uh, European Union, what very often happens is central money comes in and goes, wouldn't it be a good idea if... And uh, you end up with a with a situation where where we're getting central funding, which pays companies to put in infrastructure, whether it be hydrogen, whether it be uh, electric vehicle charging stations, whether it be natural gas pumps. I mean, it could be anything. This funding comes in and companies uh, put a tender in. They say, OK, we'll be the ones to install and maintain it for the initial period, which might be one year. It might be five years. And then after that period has ended, those charging stations, those that that infrastructure that's been put in kind of gets forgotten about. And the company maybe that put it in goes bust because they're no, they've no longer got they've not got a sustainable business model, and they they've been relying on government funds to to keep them going. And then suddenly we've got this piece of infrastructure which the people at the location where it is don't know anything about it. The people who put it in are no longer around, and all the databases that list all of these infrastructure points still listed as active. People come up expecting them to be working and they go why is this not working it's broken there's a you know uh, in some cases someone's stolen the, the cable the wire's gone what do we do so that's some of the challenges isn't it as i understand it from adopt a charger that, that that you can guys can help make sure that doesn't happen 
That's 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 one of the challenges. There are lots of things that we're learning about public charging infrastructure, and and uh, I think it's not just adopter charger that's dealing with it, but most specifically the large commercial operations that uh, both have business models that aren't yet quite panning out. Um, there are abandoned chargers. Uh, it's we we've got to continually reflect on on what is going to work and what is actually needed for for charging, particularly public charging infrastructure. I think there was a sense at the beginning that if we threw out a lot of public charging, uh, it would function that would would be necessary. Um, and there's a problem, which is that most people most of the time don't use public charging. And so Adopter Charger's mission really is to make simple public charging available in places people want to go for the next three to five years uh, without the obstacles of cards or, 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 or complicated payment schemes. Uh, and so... Uh, you know, we go in for three years with a commitment to pay the electricity and to maintain the charging stations, and 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 you know, so far we've been able to do that. I certainly know that there are uh, charging stations uh, all over the place that are having various kinds of problems, from the copper being stolen right, to the right. communications network simply not working, um, and 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 it, it complicates the the real charge here, uh, so to speak, which is. To get people into pl uh, plug-in cars, uh, if we always, I think we always try and remember the first mission isn't to try and figure out how public charging um, needs will be met five or ten years down the road, but to induce people to get plug-in cars. That's really the primary mission. Right, right. And 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 Dominic, I know that that obviously you're in a different part part of the world. Um, you're you're kind of instead of being on the west coast you're on the east coast and you're quite a long way down the the east coast do you have similar problems in florida um th th there's not really the charging infrastructure down here that you have up in uh, california especially especially in, in the san francisco area we have uh, some a few in town we have a few charge point stations in, a, in a, like a parking garage i mean there's a few places around town i guess in uh, municipal settings right. where they've someone's brought in chargers but yeah it's but like you said there's not a whole lot of electric cars on the road especially here in florida i mean and yeah it's it's rare that i see a, a a leaf on the road actually now i've seen just about as many teslas as i have leaves and there's only a handful i saw actually there's one at the end of my road last yesterday i was walking the dog and someone was doing surveying work and they were using a tesla as their surveying truck yeah, I saw oh, that photograph. That was very, that oh, was really? very cool. Yeah, yeah, I saw that this morning actually. <laughs> right. Um, and it was parked at the side of the road, wasn't it? A funny angle, I might add. Yeah, it was just cool. They don't really have ditches here in Florida so much. As they just have, you know, you can just drive off onto the grass usually. It's a little odd. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, yeah. we 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 have that in Norfolk actually, where where I'm from. Uh, very similar in a lot of ways because there's lots of soft ground, and quite right. flat. Um, the same same kind of issues um mark we one of the things you wanted to talk about today uh, was was a proposed change in the way that california utilities might uh, be able to install infrastructure for now at the moment there've been some some quite tight restrictions haven't there and and that might be about to change can you can you give us a kind of a brief rundown of that yeah um the public utilities commission back about 4 years ago um, decided that they ought not give utilities, um, which have uh, monopoly control over the air, you know uh, uh, their areas, um, the right to do uh, public charging infrastructure because they thought it might give them an unfair advantage. And so, uh, in the end, uh, companies, some of which still exist, some of which have gone out of business, were given the um, we're given the kind of public funding that was made available in order to put that stuff in. Um, I think one of the things that we've learned over time here, and I think that the Public Utilities Commission is reflecting, is that um, things aren't exactly as we thought they would be. Um, certainly there are underserved communities, but it's, it's clear that uh, in some places we ought to have a, uh, in, in a sense, we really ought to let 100 flowers. We ought to see what will best serve uh, consumers uh, as they figure out how much public charging uh, they will actually need. And so uh, they're looking at this issue again. They're loosening the restrictions on, on the utilities to uh, get into the 
sort of EVS, EVSE business, and uh, we'll see how that goes forward. I think it certainly is a positive step uh, as we go forward to, to allow utilities into what I think they are finally realizing might well be something that's incredibly important to their business going forward, mm, which is they're mm. going to need to incorporate cars both uh, as a, uh, a place where electricity goes, but perhaps more importantly, as a place from which uh, electricity uh, might come. In other words, as a uh, installed base of energy storage that they can use to regulate the grid and serve other functions for which at the present time they pay big bucks. It's going to be an interesting interesting future, I think. And I don't think that California is the only place that we're going to see this. I'd be interested to see what's, what's going on further up the coast, obviously, uh, in Oregon. Um, Dominic. Um, yes. One of the things... So, so you you're not uh, you don't uh, spend your day writing for Autoblog Green. It's kind of like a I don't want to say it's a bit on the side, but it's it's, 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 it's a bit it's, on the side. It's a bit on the side. <laughs> you you've been sure. an, uh, an associate editor at, at Autoblog Green for a very long time, um, oh. and you've covered future car technology for a very long time. You know, and your 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 biog says um, hate fossil fuels, love performance um and right. one of the things that that you are, are are known for covering quite a lot of is uh the two-wheeled world which is nice because not many people do cover two wheels uh in the, the alternative fuel segment i'm i'm sort of someone who likes to see more would like to see more of it uh but i think it's been ignored uh by the mainstream automotive press to this point um but lately you've been covering some really interesting vehicles uh, including the c1 lit um, which sounds like it could be a rude name, but it's actually a, 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 it's it's a k- bike, a b- car. It's kind of a car and a bike. It's a self balancing two wheeled car, right? Tell Automobile us about cycle. that. Sorry. Um, yeah, um, I, yeah. I've been batting around because it's not really a motorcycle. It's on two wheels and it balances. You know, it kind of goes like on two wheels, but it's enclosed cabin. So it, it's, but it's not a very motorcycle like experience to some extent you know there's a steering wheel instead of handlebars so what to call it is it's a sort of conundrum <laughs> at this point i mean I, I think in one article i referred to it as an automotorcycle but um now they've lit motors themselves up they're uh, calling it their aev or auto balancing electric vehicle which is a little awkward but uh, yeah aev so yeah it, but it's a uh, it's an interesting it's an interesting concept you know because you're like you're in a car but you're narrow within like three feet of width and um, two passengers one in the front one behind well not at this point right now they're still working on their prototypes they just they uh, they just released some video of their latest prototype um, they've been running around a little bit within August and um, long it's they've got it up to speed and they've got it making some leans it's because they've got uh, in the bottom there's gyroscope spinning, and right now they've up. The, I think they put out like six thousand foot pound of torque, so you can hit it and just fall over. It kind of stays up. Actually, if you kind of push it on a little bit, it'll just sit there and like do this little wobble thing. Right now, I'm not, it's a uh, it's quite a feat of software and that's incredible forces working together, and that with a with the uh, steering system, which is like a. It's not like mechanically linked. Mm-hmm. Wow! It's drive drive by wire. So, so, so that yeah. would be quite an interesting sort of um, that would be quite an interesting experience. I think I can't wait to get behind the wheel of one. It, obviously, if it does make it to production, production's pushed back like <laughs> like so many other right. cars in in the future fuels and, and alternative drivetrain segments. But this vehicle in, in particular, it, you know, it's got so much to give in terms of safety. You know, it's 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 effectively no wider than your average motorbike, but it's a car. Right, it's and, a lot and it doesn't require you to drive it like a motorbike. And so many people just turn off at the idea of motorbikes, and I know a lot of people just don't feel safe on motorbikes. Quite rightly, I think, because you know there's not a lot between you and the outside world. So, it'd be interesting to see uh, no, to see not. where this goes. Um, all right, so um, if if anybody's sort of interested in in seeing that, Dominic wrote a very interesting uh, post recently on uh, on Autobug Green about that. Uh, as well as covering those funny little scooters 
that OK Go did in their music video recently for I Won't Let You oh, Down. That's true. Which right? is just an amazing video. If you haven't seen that, go to the the uh, YouTubes and look it up. Not now, because you're watching the show and I will be hurt if you all turn off and go somewhere else, because that would be sad. Um, <laughs> um, Mark, you you also wanted to talk at the beginning of the show, and, and for those who are watching the show for the first time, we, we kind of give that first segment, we give our guests a chance to get things off their chest that they want to talk about. And uh, Mark, one of the things that, that you're feeling a little bereft about at the moment is Nissan's potential future lineup for its plug-in vehicles. So uh, back in 2010, the Nissan uh, Leaf launched in uh, in the... Uh, in the um in the US and I've disappeared which is very interesting ask uh, you Mark to take it from here because my camera's just died <laughs> okay yeah well I you know I'm certainly very concerned with uh you know how these brands go forward and what will most uh serve the needs of computer consumers who want uh, plug-in cars and uh you know we've heard a little bit from Nissan that they think uh, the Leaf is too electric looking and that the next car will be more normal looking. And I think we've also gotten a sense that they understand that, at least for some consumers, the 24 kilowatt hour battery pack, particularly as it seems to degrade, is just not offering the range that they want. Um, and so I've sort of heard, you know, gotten wind of uh, the sense that not only are they going to change the styling, the appearance of the car, but they will increase the battery pack size. And the notion that I've heard is that the base model will just increase in size of the battery pack, say from nominally 24 kilowatts to nominally 30 kilowatt, uh, nominally 24 kilowatt hours, excuse me, to 30 kilowatt hour. And I think that as much as I personally am interested in a 30 or 36 or maybe even a 40 kilowatt hour battery pack, that could give me a, say, 100 to 125 to 150 mile range car, and which I think, for which I think there's a serious market, I think it would be a terrible idea to discontinue the 24 kilowatt hour battery pack, the essentially 75 to 85 mile range car that the LEAF currently is. Um, it's, in a, in a sense, what it seems to me is they would be giving up the opportunity to become truly the Volkswagen Beetle of the 21st century. They need a, and uh, let's face it, most of the people who get the leave are perfectly well satisfied not only with the car and the distance it travels, right, right. but they are satisfied with that car on 120 volts in the United States. In other words, quite slowly, but given the extent to which they drive, adequately and they find no particular reason to invest in a uh, to spend another 600 to 2000 dollars in putting in a 240 volt level 2 charging station right, right though nissan doesn't seem to acknowledge the fact that these drivers do that it tells me that they ought not give up the truly mass car the mass commuter vehicle or local transport vehicle that the 24 kilowatt hour leaf right. is so, so um, because yeah. Sorry, carry on. No, no, you got it. So essentially, what you're saying is, you know, uh, you know, the, and it's it is a bit of a conundrum because you, you got you got lots of people in the in the marketplace who are willing to pay more, who are saying, yeah, I'll buy this car if it goes further, but actually, uh, your argument is this this car is 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 much more of a social leveler in its current form than it would be if it was far more expensive because it had bigger battery pack and and longer range. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, in a sense, it's the same notion when, when, when Nissan originally was broaching the idea of doing an infinity, which I suspect they will still do. They suggested that the, the great thing about it would be inductive charging, so, which to me just raises the cost of the vehicle for something that no one is asking for. Um, plugging in the car works perfectly well, just as plugging in at level one seems to work well for over 50% of the people who get a LEAF. Um, and I think that, you know, there is no doubt that a plug-in car is really the yeah. awesome computer vehicle that can give at least American workers uh, the raise that their, uh, their bosses are not giving them by simply making the cost of the commute that much less. I think that um, it was interesting because I, I, I was saying recently that I think the Leaf, the current Leaf, obviously I am a Leaf driver, put that disclaimer on the table, the current range of the Leaf is fine for me provided I've got a way of recharging it 
uh, and that's coming in the UK. Now we've now got DC quick charge stations. Most of the time, slow charging is fine, but we've got DC quick charging stations coming, uh, and there are many, many in my area. Combine that with, say, a six kilowatt onboard charger, and I'd be happy with no extra range. Those long distance trips, all that often. Um, uh, the thing that I'm just rocking at the moment is I've just spent a week with the Nissan ENV 200, which is their minivan, and. Nice. I don't I don't think of myself as a soccer mum. Um but uh I was channeling my inner Alison Hendricks all week. And those of you who watch Orphan Black will know who I'm talking about. I, I you know, I was Alison Hendricks for a week. I enjoyed it as well. <laughs> so I it would be good to see that van car van make it over to the, the US, but I don't think it will because Americans are no longer in love with the minivan. So maybe this is the minivan to come back. Be interesting to see. All right. Um Let's uh, finish off part one. And by the way, I do apologise for those of you who saw someone said it was the obelisk from 2001. <laughs> Space Obel Odyssey. Uh, yes, this is a green screen setup. And for some reason, the camera, this one right here, decided it didn't like me anymore and it quit. And so I had to go and restart the camera programme. But it's back. I'm back. And Mark did a fantastic job covering for me. That was that was so professionally done. All right. Talking about charging, one kind of one final segment about charging uh, really uh, today is BMW announced this week a light and charge concept uh, which it's demoing in Munich at its headquarters and the idea is that you take the lighting circuit from your average run-of-the-mill street lamp and you take out the really really energy inefficient light bulb that obviously most street lamps or the old-fashioned street lamps I guess still use that light uh, with a very very ultra energy efficient LED light bulb which can output far more light for far less energy and then you make use of that excess capacity in the lighting circuits underneath the street to put charging stations at the bottom of the lampposts so people can charge their cars uh, underneath street lamps. Now there are some debates as to how effective that would be and how many of these street lamps could be used in that way because obviously you wouldn't have a huge spare capacity. Uh, but BMW is prototyping it. It's uh, part of their Charge Now program, so it will all be uh, remotely accessible. You pay for your charging remotely. Uh, currently in Munich, uh, in but could come uh, into... And interestingly, uh, someone sent me a, 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 an email this week going, well, this, we've, this has been happening in Sofia in Bulgaria for a very long time. Here are the photos. So it's not a new concept. What do we think, though, uh, Dominic, of the idea of charging underneath the light? Um, I think it's an interesting concept. It could work in some neighborhoods. Some neighborhoods, not so much. But, but um, yeah, how many how many street lights do you have on a, on a block? Well, it depends on the size of the block. But say you have one street light for every uh, four or five walk-ups, two or three levels. So it depends on you. Not everyone on the street is going to be able to have a place to plug in if they all have electric cars, but it, we're not at that stage anyway. So just as a starter, it's good. I think what's even more important, just from an environmental point of view, is the LED itself in the street lights. Like, why don't we have that everywhere already anyway? Because it's such a big waste of money and in light source of light pollution the leds shine down mm -hmm. so there's like mm -hmm. a lot less light pollution I'm, I'm just really big on the whole led street lights to, just to start with but uh yeah for those people who don't have garages because that's pretty much if you want to drive an ev you almost have to have a garage to charge in mm -hmm. or, or at least a driveway or a carport or something but on, on street parking it's it's pretty tough mm -hmm. until we mm -hmm. have like bigger batteries like uh, mark was saying that the uh the leaf might come with and, and have uh, just local fast charge places that you can charge go and charge in if you're if you're just stuck with on street parking that would be your only option i, I guess it could work for some neighborhood Don't worry about you know cords being stolen if the cords are with the light post or with the car i'm not sure how all that mark probably has a more insight into how all, all that can work well, I, you know, it, it, I think this is a, a, a logical idea that people have had for many years. Uh, in the States, we generally have been told that there is a problem with the voltage that um, uh, standard street lighting uh, is run at and that there would be a certain incompatibility um, with charging. 
And so I don't know the extent to which that's true or not. I've certainly heard that there are companies that want to offer a, a combined uh, uh, charging and lighting situation. The, obviously, LEDs make this more likely, more possible. And I think particularly in workplace parking lots, there is just no reason for uh, if there's a basic compatibility or it can be resolved with transformers or, or, or uh, some, some fancy uh, technological, uh, you know, I'm, the word is escaping me what I'm looking for here. But um, uh, obviously it's, it, it's a place where there ought to be at the very least 110 volt outlets if that is uh, feasible and as cheap as it seems it should be in workplace parking lots where work, Places are often spending lots of money trying to figure out how to bring uh, level two charging to the workplace and then having to deal with the repercussions of level two charging at the workplace. It seems this one that really starts to get, it, get charging available uh, to lots of folks uh, without, you know, without the complications of, 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 of massive investment in level two. Whether in, in terms of on street parking, it certainly would be nice if there's a compatibility there, or we can look towards the future and bring uh, uh, electricity to folks with plug in cars uh, at the street level, particularly in places like San Francisco, where there is truly yeah. a problem. Yeah. Uh, because not everyone's got a garage. I mean, the, the great case in point, Mark, I, I can't remember quite uh, how steep your, your street is. But I remember from visiting you a couple of years ago, it's quite steep. And I mean, maybe not steep by San Francisco terms. Like I can't quite remember. All I can remember about San Francisco was the hills and being on a motorbike and driving along, riding along perfectly straight road. And then suddenly the road goes like this and straight down, which is something we don't have in the UK. And I remember panicking about that. But I remember you living on quite a steep hill. And I remember you not having a huge amount of parking. Well, we have parking. I have a garage, so I've always been able to charge a car in my garage. And uh, but th for the rest, you know, the, the hill isn't so still so steep that it would affect whether or not you could plug in on the hill. You know, out, outside if they were to offer charging off of the lamppost. Right. So people wouldn't be going all because I know some people do get upset about parking on hills. Certainly in the UK, I've met people who go, "Oh, I can't park on a hill." Oh no, mustn't park on a hill. All right, final final story of the segment. And this one goes to Mr. Ron Barron. Uh, this, this is a story from not last week, but actually from the week before. He went on CNBC uh, shortly after Tesla's Q3 earnings call and said, uh, I'm really, really happy about how well uh, Tesla's doing. I think, you know, despite the fact that the, the, the Model X is going to be delayed, nothing to worry about. Um, and he made some really interesting predictions. And we're going to talk about the predictions very briefly before before our first break. Um, the first thing he said was that he was expecting his investments, which is between 140 and 150 billion. Sorry, 140 and 150 million. I do apologize. 140, 150 million dollars that his company has invested in Tesla. And he's a mutual fund manager. So, uh Essentially, people give him money to invest. Um, and he said he thinks that the people who have invested with him and with his company should get about a tenfold return on their investment within 10 years time, while the rest of the stock market is going to be giving about a twofold return. Um, that's the first thing. And the second thing is, he said he thinks that everyone is going to be Tesla customers within 25 years. So we'll all be driving Teslas within 25 years because only Tesla gets it. And then the third bit of information that he threw in at the very last minute was uh, that BMW, This and I should point out completely, this is a rumour and I have not been able to substantiate this. This is just Barron's claim that BMW is going to ditch the internal combustion engine forever within 10 years. Interestingly, Barron didn't say what for, but there are obviously and there's an underlying implication there that it would be for the electric motor. However, I think I would be neg negligent to, to not note that BMW has been working for many years closely with Toyota. Toyota, of course, being a hydrogen fuel cell uh, supporter and obviously very high in hybrid vehicle tech. What do we make of those three bits of information, Mark? Well, uh, I, you know, I 
I, I can't say. I, I think that everyone will be uh, will all be driving Teslas in ten years. Though I'd certainly love to see uh, you know legacy fossil fuel uh, car makers uh, have to move in a different direction. And the notion that BMW might be out of the internal combustion engine car business within ten years. I mean, I, you know, I, I love the notion. Let the meme fly. Um, I'm not going to bust that balloon. Let people think that that is going to happen, uh, and and maybe it will. It seems a rather than 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 uh, really possible. But uh, you know, you got to dream big. Uh, I think the one thing we do know is that uh, you know, if we were to turn a tremendous portion of the fleet uh, over to batteries we will go a long way to meet the climate goals that all these governments have outlined um, if, the, uh, you know, if, if humans are to have a, a chance um, many, many generations down the line. Uh, and what's certainly perfectly clear is that fuel cell vehicles, even uh, as uh, outlined by its biggest supporters, um, including the government of the state of California, can't contribute to meeting those goals. Uh, even in their wildest uh, uh, um, uh, ambitions, uh, you know, they talk uh, about hope hopefully uh, achieving, you know, like twenty five thousand fuel cell cars uh, by twenty twenty seven or or some date like that. Well, that just doesn't get us anywhere. We've already got a few hundred thousand plug in cars on the road in, in the state in the states, and and obviously fifty thousand or a hundred thousand more around the world, and that. Is the is the way we're going to move uh, in terms of climate? Yeah, um, Dominic, what do you think? I think he's certainly got a half full glass of Kool Aid. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I think that's actually what I I said. I think he's the most Kool Aid drinking person I've encountered in the business right. community because you know you expect investors and business people to be kind of skeptical in a lot of ways. I mean, okay, you make money right. off having good vibes about a company and, and making a bet that that company's going to do well. But I've never encountered anybody who's that kind of open and, and positive about the company moving that far forward into the future. I mean, I'm personally, I'm, I'm pretty bullish on Tesla and I'm a, I'm a big kind of fan, I guess. But uh, even tenfold from their current valuation, I can't even see that. But, but uh, yeah, well, and, and <laughs> everyone driving a Tesla... Uh, well, it all comes down to what happens with the, with the Tesla three. I, I, mean, I don't think they're going to everyone driving a Tesla. And maybe maybe you wanted to say everyone driving an electric or something because yeah, you know it's going to it's it's spurring competition. And when, if the uh, if the three is successful, it will spur a lot of competition. If it's you know if it really takes off like um, everyone or Musk is, at least is expecting or hoping. Uh, yeah, with the, the investment in the battery factory and everything, because they're, they're expecting to move a huge number of cars to make all that investment worthwhile. So it, it's like a big gamble. Um, it it could happen, but you know, before anything can really take off, like all the cars being electric by 2025 or 2030, well, you can't replace the fleet that fast even. But to get us just down the road that far, we're going to need to see even better batteries and faster charging i mean i'm i'm pretty confident in where the batteries will be at that point in time but the speed of charging to get that at the same time as having a lot of capacity is going to be key so yeah, people who yeah. can because so many people you know like we were talking speaking earlier they have to park on the street and then the only way they can really get into the electric vehicle world is to have fast charging available because it's just not we're not going to have plugs at every parking spot in the city. You know, well, you know so. that that's one of the that's one of the that's one of the interesting uh, things behind the Adopt the Charger program, which obviously knows a lot about is is uh, is that idea of fancy charging stations just having an, a ubiquity of plugs, and perhaps maybe Mark, if I may be so bold as to suggest a, a concept where where plugging in is considered very much like Wi-Fi. We, you no longer really have to ask, was it okay if I use this Wi-Fi? It's obvious that this Wi-Fi is for guests and you can use it. It's obvious that this 110 volt outlet is for you. You can use it. Yeah, I mean, my own work on, on level two with adopter charger aside, I think what's becoming kind of clear is that, um, you know, ubiquity is one of the ways this problem is going to have to be solved for folks. And I think, you, you know, simple, dumb, 120 volt ubiquity at workplace 
um, you know, solves an awful lot of the problem and might be the basic way that an, an awful lot of apartment dwellers will, will, will plug in. And if you've got, uh, you know, I think everyone thought, uh, certainly in government uh, and some of the uh, EVSPs thought, everything was going to be all about level two charging. And I think as we, we learn how this is really uh, functioning in the real world, what we see is that often uh, actually level one and, le and DC fast charging are the ways um, the bulk of the problem for most mm. people. Mm. So we've got to be, we've got to keep our eyes open to what people are actually doing um, and not allow folks who've got a uh, proprietary interest in one solution or another to lead, um, particularly with public spending, um, because it will just take us down a, a rabbit hole every time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's have an ad break um, and we'll be back uh, with part two and part three uh, shortly. Uh, we here at Transport Evolved believe in the freedom of information and the freedom of the Internet. Uh, as a consequence, obviously, we do support net, uh, net neutrality. We don't agree with paywalls and we don't agree with the idea of locking away information uh, so that those who can afford to pay for it are the only people who can access it. But in order for Transport Evolved to be the growing, lively, information hub for the ever-changing world of future car technology. It takes a lot of time and money to get the site up and running. For a regular viewer, listener or visitor to Transport Evolved, we'd like you to consider taking out a monthly donation to help us pay the bills, keep the walls from the door and ensure our show continues to bigger and better things. And in the best traditions of free broadcasting, you can choose to make a one-off payment or opt to subscribe for one of four different reoccurring monthly payments through PayPal. Uh, for £5, 10 20 or £40 pounds a month, you can help us bring you the honest, knowledgeable coverage that you crave. Uh, to make your payment, head over to www.transportevolve.com and click on the subscribe link in the right hand rail. It really is that simple. And thank you to those that do for your continued support of the show and the network. It really does make a big difference. Thank you so much. So moving on to part two of the show with the fantastic Mark Geller from Plugin America and Adopter Charger and Dominic Yoni from Autoblog Green. We're going to talk about the Rex Swap scandal, the title of today's show. I'm going to play this video in the background. I've, I've stripped out the uh, audio. Um, this is an advert from Lexus for their new CT200H. Now, this goes back a while because uh, earlier this year, back in May, uh, Lexus got its knuckles wrapped because it ran an advert which portrayed uh, cars, electric cars, as slow, boring and backwards. Uh, and it included a picture of someone plugging in a Nissan Leaf. Now, this one has been produced by Funny or Die, the guys uh, at the Funny or Die. They are known for being quite edgy, Funny or Die group, uh, guys. Um, but this particular one uh, is called Dadula Party. It's incredibly, incredibly controversial. It shows two, two, two sets of guys heading off from uh, in California near Las Vegas all the way to, sorry, in California, in LA, all the way to Las Vegas for a Dadula party. Uh, one group of guys go in a CT200H hybrid, the other guys go in a BMW i3 and they drive and of course the guys get held up because they don't have anywhere to charge and they end up having to slow charge. Uh, there's no rapid charging infrastructure on that route, which I'm sure is the reason why it was chosen. Uh, but it basically negative stereotype you can think of. Right, Mark? Yeah, this happens uh, quite frequently. I mean, you know, what can you say if you, if you, you know, bring a hammer and what you've got is a, a, a screw you need to screw in. You're just, you know, you, you know, you, it might work, but you're going to make a mess of it. Well, the, and they made a mess of it. They did, but then the joke was on them, wasn't it? Because this is a this is a five minute ad, so we're talking big bucks here. It's a five minute ad, uh, played all the way through. Obviously, the i3 Rex, the i3 Rex, they sorry, the i3 they used, the car that they said was an i3 in the ad uh, had DC fast charging. Spilt my own uh, Dana Ma there, and uh, it turns out, uh, thanks to Tom Malogny, um, who is very, very eagle-eyed, was watching this. Uh, obviously, a member of the the Plug in America board and, and a BMW i3 Rex driver, so he knows what he's looking for. He spotted a filler cap on the front wing of the car used in this ad, 
And those who know the car will know that the BMW is, the i3 is sold in two different variants. There's an all electric version, which has just one filler cap at the back on the rear motor. And that's got your, your standard inlet. And if you've got the DC quick charge capability, that is there too. If you have the i3 Rex, the range extended version, which has a small gasoline range extended engine that can ex increase your range by about 80 miles on a small tank of gasoline. Uh, there's an extra filler cap at the front, on the front wing. And this car in this advert seemed to alternate between not having one and having one. And in fact, in a certain number of shots, they'd switch away and then switch back. And, a, in, in, you know, in the previous frame, it would have a gas filler quite clearly visible and then it wouldn't. So it was airbrushed over. Um, but they didn't get, the continuity folks didn't get all of the frames, which is what made it so hilarious. Why is that, Dominic? Because the BMW i3 can 160 miles. The i3 Rex oh. could have made that trip just well, filling up. Well, it would have to fill up at least twice because, I mean, if it left with a full tank, because this is a very small tank, so it only, so your initial charge takes, uh, what, 80 miles or so yeah. around the, in that neighborhood. And then the gasoline, next 80 miles. But the trip from looking at it is uh, 269 and a half miles, give or take, mm -hmm. from LA to Las Vegas. So you'd have to fill up the gas at least one more time. One, 150, yeah. But it would be, it Actually, would be. You'd have to fill up twice. Yeah. So you'd have to stop. And, and yeah, I, I'm a little conflicted with this because it's just a, like Mark was saying, it's the wrong tool. It's not, a, even with the range extender, it's not a great long distance car. It can't keep up, you know, at highway speeds, even with the, the with the uh, range extender in there. It, you know, it can't keep the battery charged. The, the poor thing has to work really hard to do it. Someone, we, Autoblog had, a, had one up north in Michigan on a trip. And they're doing the uh, technology of the year report research in LA Auto Show and um, they they were talking about it on the Autoblog podcast last week and they were, it was quite concerning I mean the guy loved this, loves the car but on that long trip it kept cutting him down to 50 miles an hour or so and he, he in his opinion he found it like dangerous but um, so yeah it's not really it's not a long distance driving tool it's not. I mean, this is and this is this is the challenge, isn't it? They've they've picked a vehicle which they know is not going to be able to make this trip. They've made fun of it, and then right. the Rex the Rex could have been driven carefully, and it would have made it to La to Las Vegas maybe twenty thirty minutes after the hybrid. But which uh, is am not I not? Big... Sorry, uh, am I not mistaken here? This was basically a Toyota paid advert. It was, and a Toyota that they paid hired ad. they hired those guys who you know one might have hoped would say we're not going to participate in your corporate propaganda that doesn't serve the interests of, uh, you know, that which we presumably believe in and all of that. And in essence, they're being, you know, climate change deniers. I mean, the, the, the issue with, with, with Toyota here is Toyota, you know, being this huge multinational corporation that's throwing its weight around to uh, slag off plug-in cars because they happen not to want to make them. Right. And this is this is ties in very nicely with what we were saying last week on the show. Toyota claims no one wants them to make electric cars. And obviously this this advert, for those who don't know, uh, Lexus is Toyota's luxury arm. So although they they have their own garages, their own dealerships, they're actually the same company. It's the same, diff, just different branch of the same company. Um, and I think w I, I kind of looked on the, on the uh, continuity errors. I'm going to be optimistic and i'm going to hope that those continuity errors and they were left in on purpose as a for comedic value so that somebody could spot it but i know that's not actually what happened unless someone can tell me otherwise um the other thing that i find incredibly interesting is in the uk that advert would have been pulled it wouldn't have even made it onto television now interestingly that advert has been pulled from youtube three times Alexa right. put it on their stream. Somebody else put it on their stream, and it's it's going up and down like yeah a yo-yo. Which is one reason I stripped the audio out and talked over the top of it because um and I made sure that the bit I showed was only long enough 
to comply with all copyright laws. <laughs> so, but it's Who, on the, it's on YouTube. It's available if someone wants to go and find it. Who's pulling it? The YouTube. Or I don't know if it's YouTube or if it's Toyota? Lexus or if it's Toyota or if it's Funny or Die. Were you suggesting that it wouldn't get on air in Britain because it contains too many lies? Yeah. 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 I we, mean, we, and of course, this... in this country, we we have this thing, which you know, <laughs> sort of free speech to well, the we max. Have, we have truth in advertising. So we have truth in advertising, and that I felt not truth in advertising. Um. Yes. Okay. You you could you could you could you could tread that very fine line. Where you'd say, okay, there aren't any rapid charges between those two points. And yes, if you were making that trip, you would have to stop and charge along the way. But as we pointed out in our article this week, the biggest faux pas made by Lexus in this is that as any BMW salesperson will tell you, as any BMW i3 owner will tell you, BMW has a free loaner car program for anybody who owns an i3 who needs to make a long distance trip. So you would just rock up at your I need to borrow a car. I'm going to Las Vegas for the weekend. And they'd go, sure, park over there. Here are the keys to your jobs are good. And of course, there is a fast charger station in between Las Angeles and Las Vegas at Barstow, but it's a, it's a Tesla supercharger. Yes, it's a Tesla supercharger. And Don't of course, that's... Lexus would want to compare their car to a similar luxury car, yeah. but... Not that the 200 is exactly <laughs> similar to the no, that's Model true. S. But... That's true. All right, let's move on. It, I mean, you should watch the advert if you haven't, because it's it just it's laughable. It really is. I, I mean, I, I was laughing at it because it was just so bad. So bad. It was cringeworthy. Um, and it became a pastiche of itself quite quickly. All right, um, on to the UK and sexy hamsters. That's all I'm going to say. Kia Soul EV has launched in the UK. Along with the sexy hamster lady, apparently. Um, uh, now, interestingly, I was invited to the Kia Soul EV launch th uh, this past week, and I, um, I was going to go, and then I, uh, for, for health reasons, I said, I'm, "Can I just wait until there's one for review?" They had a UK launch, and it was half a day, half a day of driving around London, which, frankly, is not enough time to get behind the wheel of a car and decide whether it's good or not. Um, EPA range for this car is 93 miles. The NEDC range, which is very optimistic, test cycle is 131. I don't think anybody will get 131 miles out of it, even in London traffic. Um, all the reports are that this is a very good car, but like very often, like so many good cars, it seems to be very, very limited production. Kia only expects to, to sell between 100 and 200 cars in the UK in the next coming couple of years. Um, they're only going to have 11 dealers outside of the greater London area, two in London and 11 outside. So it basically means I can't recommend anybody buy this because it's, it's not going to get the service and support it needs. Mark, you live in a compliance car state. Help me out with this. Well, I finally am seeing some of these. I, you know, the question of whether one should get a compliance car is a personal decision. I mean, uh, the truth with electric cars has largely been that regardless of whether the car is uh, made by a serious car company uh, or a car company that's just meeting its compliance needs with the ZEV mandate, the cars are fine. Everyone loves their car. People love the Honda Fit. Um, people, you know, there are more Fiats crawling, electric Fiats crawling around San Francisco I mean, you just can't go down the block without seeing one. It's a very, you really ought to, Dominic, just come by San Francisco, uh, the Bay Area at some point, uh, just to feel what it's like for, to see so many electric cars on the road. Um, very, right. it's, it's just gotten incredibly common, which isn't to say that it's, you know, five or 10% of the cars, but it is along the way that if you know what an electric car looks like or a plug-in car, you see them all the time. Yeah. And I must say, right. I drove the I drove the the, uh, the Kia Soul, and I really liked it. Um, it it there are lots of things about it that I find satisfying. It's a, it's it's a, it's it's not that dissimilar from my old Rav4 EV um, in terms of sort of the footprint and the way you sit in the car, etc. Um, and I and I've met a few people now who are buying the uh, the Leaf or the other compliance cars. Uh, range is insufficient, you know, your 80, 90 mile range car. This car does have a bit more uh, range to it. It seems that it's got a, uh, you know, a 30 kilowatt hour battery that's, you know, 27, 27, kil yeah. 
No, yeah, well, I think it's 27 kilowatt hours usable. It's actually right. a bigger right. battery right. than that. Whereas the Leaf is actually 24, but you know, it's really 21 usable. Rapidly, it becomes 19 usable. <laughs> yes. um, you know, which is what I'm seeing. And so there is a a big difference. How how well the batteries will hold up, I don't know. Um, I you know, if I were getting an electric car today, that. that the, the soul might well be the car I would get, and I wouldn't really worry about the whole compliance issue. I think the big question is, is Kia looking at this as, uh, you know, what does Kia want to learn from this? Uh, does Kia, is, are they looking towards a possible electric future, and is this a, a car where they're looking to see uh, how successful it is and whether or not they ought to get into this seriously? Certainly, mm -hmm. Fiat ought to be doing that based on uh, the success of yeah, the Fiat yeah. 500 here. It's a very interesting one, actually, because Kia and Hyundai are, the, uh, are joined. Obviously, uh, Hyundai is, is is kind of the upper end. Kia is kind of the more mainstream brand. And Kia is, is focusing on plug-in vehicles. Hyundai is focusing on fuel cell vehicles. And that's the only kind of time i've seen that happen where you've got this essentially the same automaker two different brands again under one auto under one parent company going those different routes um, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens i hear what you're saying i can't wait to drive it and i think i'm going to like it i just i suppose it's because i've personally been 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 bitten in the bum we've got a chevy vault <laughs> we can only get it serviced at two dealers in england and one in scotland and i live in the southwest of england so I would have to drive 400 miles to Scotland to that dealer. My other, my nearest dealer is 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 uh, is 80 miles away, 70, 70, 80 miles away. So it's just like, well, I'm worried that if this really is a compliance car, and I've heard a lot from Kia, which, which suggests this is a car we're being forced to make rather than we want to make, and this is a a car that we're going to sell for now, but pff, don't guarantee on it being around for a long time. That's what worries me. Um, interestingly though. We're now going to talk about a car that has been around for a long time, is selling in tiny, tiny, tiny volumes, but is now the cheapest car you can buy anywhere in the US. Dominic, bit of maths and yes. the Mitsubishi Aimev. So tell us about this. I uh, actually didn't see that. Oh, you didn't see it's, that. It's, 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 it... <laughs> it, it was on, it was on an auto. It was an um. I think it was originally on. Uh, it was I know Autoblog Green covered it, but it was originally a Yahoo's uh, story. So uh, essentially, okay. this this story goes: if you have, if you live in the right state, and you have, uh, you live in the right county, and you have an income of a certain amount or more, then you can buy a brand new 2014 or sorry 2015 Mitsubishi iMove for less than ten thousand dollars. The problem I have with this, though, is that there are quite a lot of uh, stipulations here. Um, <laughs> does your does your state have frequent mudslides, droughts, occasionally rioting, and of the open? You may close come close to the ten thousand dollar prize. California is offering a two and a half thousand dollar tax credit. This mobile insectozoid <laughs> says Yahoo, along with a seven and a half thousand dollar federal tax credit uh, and then you can have your 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 do you have a, a federal taxable income this year then you can claim money back etc 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 um mark this is mm. kind of a lesson in creative financing isn't it more than anything else no i think it's a it's kind of a, a the the story itself is a bs approach to what's a, a, a is a reason you know where they should be actually letting people know what the story is and and they got they made a mistake right from their description of the twenty five hundred dollar uh, California rebate as a tax credit, which it is not. It's a rebate. It's a check that you get in the mail. Um, the seventy five hundred dollar federal tax credit is a tax credit, and yes, you need the taxable income, and and they are correct. But that applies to any electric car or yeah. plug in car yeah. for which the tax credit is is an option. And what people do um, if they can't take advantage of the federal tax credit is they lease the vehicle. And I think, you know, what we're seeing in the States anyway is that folks who even uh, in their own history don't lease cars are leasing plug-in cars, particularly yes. electric cars, yeah. Be but either because of being able to roll in the tax credit or the notion that in three years the universe of electric cars is going to be so different that I'm 
really going to be ready for something else. Um, so, you know, it's just another example of a, of a, of a, you know, one of the ridiculous news sites that we are uh, drowning in these days. Yeah. Um, making a story that isn't a story, um, making a car that could serve perfectly well as a great commuter vehicle for a middle class person uh, into some way of mocking the car as a toy for the rich. If you, I mean, it's, it's a convoluted story that does yes. a disservice to everyone. Tell, tell me this, because um, I mean, one of the, and this is something that I've discussed with everybody from my mum through to, you know, um, people in the industry. The challenge with electric vehicles is that the people who really stand to benefit from them are the ones, the very ones who can't afford them. The, the people who stand to benefit from hybrid vehicles are the very people who can't afford them. The people who struggle to buy any other kind of future fuel, future technology vehicle, they are the ones who stand to benefit most if they can't afford it in the first place. Does that make sense? So it's the people no. who can't afford it are the ones who stand to benefit most. There, uh, there's a perception that that's the case. and uh, But it actually, for many folks, is not the case. I mean, I'm not making the case that you know poor people can buy plug-in cars and benefit from them. But uh, certainly your middle-class commuter, um, let's say a school teacher who's driving 25 or 30 miles each way to work, um, maybe into a community they can't afford to live in, but they are commuting there. Um, if the charging offered at the workplace um, is smart, uh, there is no doubt that that car will save the money. There's, uh, because I haven't been writing on my blog, there's a, there's a post up on my blog from about a year ago. I had met a San Francisco cop, I've probably told the story here before, yes, uh, yeah. who lived 60 miles away from San Francisco, drove his, bought a Leaf because he could get a Leaf for two or $300 a month. He was spending more than that in fuel for his beloved pickup truck. Once he got the leaf and he was paying 250 or something like that dollars a month, plus some electricity at home, which didn't amount to all that much, and the station chief let him use the 120 volt outlet at work, he had a perfect scenario that saved him money every month. And this was a police officer, um, you know, not a, 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 you know, a Google executive. Uh, and so I think that the problem is really one of uh, uh, of education and outreach and putting the numbers together in a way that folks who uh, uh, who could benefit understand what the numbers really are. Uh, mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. it's not as 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 difficult to reach as people contend. It's a it's a nice story that these are cars for the rich, um, but it's just not the case uh, in 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 many cases. And it's also worth I suppose it's also worth pointing out that if you can't afford a brand new plug-in car there are other avenues i mean that's how i ended up getting into plug-in cars i bought my first electric car was a thousand pounds and it was slow but it gave me the bug and from that point then i was able to use the money that i'd saved not buying gas to yeah, well, then I mean, upgrade and kind of climb up the ladder let me make another case here which is that what we've got is you know tens of thousands of, of cars coming off lease nissan leafs and and, and other plug-in vehicles that are coming off lease, and that Nissan and other car companies don't really know what to do with. Um, the the you know the the present owners of 2011 and 2012 Nissan Leafs and other you know are are kind of pissed off because the value of the car is now so low. But that's also an opportunity um, if what the state is trying to do is get folks or you know social justice advocates would like to do is to get car people out of dirty, uh, expensive. Uh, low mileage vehicles, uh, you know, bad uh, MPG vehicles, um, and get them into cleaner, cheaper uh, plug-in cars. There is a there should be a synergy between getting uh, working people uh, who could very well benefit from a ten thousand dollar plug-in car if all the pieces come together. Um, the problem is that it's it you know the, everything is uh, in the economy is pressed towards making people uh, buy new vehicles. So, you know, because they want to get the economy churning. Yeah. Uh, well, we've got to figure out ways to get to get those those used cars into the hands of folks who can benefit from them. And I think Tesla wants to do, obviously, with its certified retail program. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. All right. Next week, 2014 L.A. Auto Show. It's getting to that time of year uh, where where uh, those in the automotive world kind of 
spend their time either away at or they've got Thanksgiving and various other things to, to think about. Um, it's a very busy time in the automotive world. So you're going to see lots of bleary eyed automotive journalists and executives in the coming weeks. All right. So nothing huge uh, grabs my attention, Dominic, about the upcoming L.A. Auto Show. Uh, there's going to be the, the Cadillac ELR, the 2016 Cadillac. Cadillac ELR is going to be unveiled. Now, interestingly, that vehicle is obviously based on the Chevy Volt, and we know that the new Chevy Volt, the 2016 Chevy Volt, will be unveiled in January at the Detroit, uh, the North American International Auto Show. Do we think that the unveiling of the ELR is going to give us a sneak peek about what the Volt's going to look like? Dominic's vanished. Are you there, Dominic? He's gone quiet. Mark, what do you think? Well, I hope so. Um, perhaps that's that's what we'll see. Um, you know, the Cadillac ELR. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I don't quite know what to say about that vehicle. Uh, so uh, I, I hope there are improvements that give us hints about the 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 Volt going forward. Uh, we shall see. <laughs> Is there anything else that that, that grabs your attention? You know, I, I wish there were some more news coming out from, you know, from Nissan. Uh, you know, Nissan is positioned to really be the significant player here in ways that really matter moving forward with, you know, plug-in technology uh, and making the cars available to more and more people. And I, I guess we're not going to, the, the advanced word is we're not going to see very much from them. I would have liked to have seen them announce, you know, a, a version of the ENV 200 being available here as both a uh, a light commercial transport vehicle and uh, perhaps for the soccer mom. But uh, apparently that's not in the cards. Uh, you know, I, I suspect what we're going to see is uh, the green tech side will be talking about fuel cell vehicles. Will Toyota, it, it appears, will probably do everything they can to, to dominate. Are they going to be presenting at, at LA? With well, the, it's interesting uh, because, because there's going to be an, uh, there's going to be a, uh, there's going to be an unveiling coming up at the, uh, that week, actually on Monday, uh, there's going to be an unveiling of the fuel cell sedan. And, uh, and I'm hoping that Dominic is, is going to come and join us uh, in a second. He is, he did just try and, and, and get in. I know that you don't like the fuel cell sedan, Mark. Well, it's not about not liking it. I, you know, I, I think that the numbers just don't work out. I mean, it's it's very hard to understand. I mean, you know, I'm I'm into this for for a pretty simple reason. I think petroleum and fossil fuels are, you know, us. Yes. Yeah. And uh, the question becomes: To what extent would a hydrogen-powered fuel cell vehicle help us achieve the? Uh, changes we need to achieve. And I think what's very clear at this point is that uh, even on the one claim that they may have made for the last 20 years, which is that fuel cell vehicles would be able to go further and charge faster um, than uh, electric cars, is just not true. Tesla has already proven that there's a 250, 300 mile range car that's, that's, that's out there and available. The fuel cell, fuel cell vehicles are not going to challenge them in terms of price. They barely challenge them in terms of refueling time, um, and no one's no one's got a pathway to hundreds of thousands or millions of fuel cell cars in the time required to actually impact climate, whereas battery cars do. Yeah, and so to me, that's the answer. Uh, it's going to be interesting. I mean, we we we're suffering from some uh, from some technical problems at the moment, which I'm uh, struggling to. Uh to sort out so we may we may end up uh, going to our, our advert um quickly but i mean toyota is going to have this fuel cell unveiling ceremony on on monday evening my time so it's tuesday morning uh japanese time we already know that the car is going to be really really expensive we already know that that obviously there's going to be three million yen in incentives um is there anything that you think is going to surprise us find something that that could potentially give this vehicle a, a reprieve well, I hope Dominic's on because I'm, you know, for me in that regard. I mean, I find, <laughs> I find quite compelling. I went to the Toyota dealer the other day, um, actually, to inquire about the last of the RAV4 EVs, and they, they absolutely haven't even gotten back to me with a, 
with a price. Oh, so really? I don't exactly understand what's going on because I know they still do have some cars. But but he the 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 dealer uh, general manager, uh, you know, with whom I've had a bit of a relationship for ten years or more, um, being an owner of a Rav4 EV from two thousand two. Um, you know, he asked me what I thought of this fuel cell. I mean, he knew I was not going to be a big fan, but you know, he their program and, and, and they are launching the fuel cell vehicle in fewer dealerships than handled the RAV4 in 2002. I mean, in 2002, you could get a RAV4 EV at 25 dealerships in California. Um, well, I think he said it was eight or nine dealerships would have the fuel cell vehicle. Uh, and and it's just self-evidently not a super serious program. It's one that's designed around the ZEV mandate. And if anything, the the real questions that ought to be asked are are what roles the ZEV mandate has had, not only positively, which obviously it has had, but also negatively. I think we're trapped because of the ZEV mandate in a 75 to 90 mile range electric car and uh, a fuel cell car, and that the credits yeah. drive companies to do that, and, and thus the sort of missing 150-mile range car um, just is unrewarded by the credit uh, situation, by the credit scenario that, that uh, the ZEV mandate lay, lays out. And because the California Air Resources Board is so devoted to, uh, to fuel cells, whether because they actually believe in them or to save face because they've believed in them for 25 years, I do not know. Right. But, um, you know, we're, we're kind of trapped there. Mm, mm. Uh, Dominic, you, you, should be, you should be back now. I don't know if you can hear me. Okay, well, I think that's uh, that's because something's gone wrong with the with the speaker setup. So uh, I'm going to try and, and solve that, and we're going to have a quick ad break. So uh, I do apologise for the technical problems we're suffering today. I'm not entirely sure why we're having those, but uh, uh, Dominic, hang tight. I will ring you back shortly, uh, and let's have a quick ad break in the interim period. Do you enjoy the show? Uh, do you like wearing fun and unique clothes that support the things you love? Then you're going to want to head over to www.transportsevolved.com where you can show your support of Transport Evolved by buying one of our fabulous Transport Evolved t-shirts or apparel. Uh, now, how this works is we've got everything from hoodies through to uh, and t-shirts through to water bottles, badges and tote bags. And they'll be sent direct from our partners at Spreadshirt to your home address in double quick time. And what's more, uh, by, by, by buying something from that shop and supporting us, uh, you will be able to uh, effectively help us. You'll be giving us a kickback as a thanks for our hard work on the show. Uh, you'll get something cool to wear and you'll also get a warm, fuzzy feeling. And I, that's a nice thing to have. A warm, fuzzy feeling uh, that you can have and and keep to know that you've supported the show. What's not to love? Uh, so please do head over to the website www.transportevolve.com and support us and head to the shop. Uh, we've got some really horrible things going on today. Uh, Dominic, I don't think you can hear me. I don't think Dominic can hear me one one little iota. We are going to try and fix this. Uh, but we're going to talk about autonomous cars, Mr. Mark Geller. You're still with us, aren't you? Yes, I am. Fantastic. All right. So we're going to talk about autonomous cars and a, uh, a research piece this week, which suggests that um, by 2020, the first autonomous vehicles will be hitting the market and within 15 years of that so by 2035 three quarters of all new cars sold new vehicles sold will be self-driving what do you make of that i don't know what to make of that to me it seems if once you get into the realm of autonomous cars and clearly there's going to be an increasing amount of uh, of autonomousness to the vehicles um I don't know what the point of having a car is. Uh, you know, I, 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 I kind of basically fear that uh, once we're in the realm of autonomous vehicles, it's going to be autonomous persons for the 1%. And I don't know what they'll plan for everybody else because, uh, I mean, maybe this will become so cheap and so ubiquitous that, in fact, uh, essentially, 
half the population. I don't know what percentage of the population will own private cars, but they will get an, or, an autonomously driven vehicle that can take them from point to point. And, and I guess there will be some sort of public transit for everybody else. I don't know. It's a, it's a vision that, that uh, I, 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 I'm not sure. You know, I think in, in terms of safety, obviously, autonomous vehicles are, are, are potentially very useful. Uh, but cite me, I'm not a big d- fan of driving for driving's sake. I enjoy it. I like driving, um, and I would be loath to give up control of the car <laughs> just because, you know, I don't know. I, I, I like steering. Dominic, you're back with us, aren't you? Yes. Fantastic. Yes. <laughs> if you all stick around into the post show, I'll tell everybody what's been going on today. I have no idea. Uh, we've had basically things are just overheating, I think. It's just all going a bit, bit, bit dodgy. Uh, Sorry, you you didn't get to talk about the, the hydrogen fuel cell in the in the last segment, but uh, uh, you did uh, you, you did hear all of that regarding the the self driving cars, right? I cut the last detail end of it. I, are you asking what I think about the possibility? Yeah, do, do you think do you think really by twenty thirty five we're going to have three quarters of new vehicles being self driving? That sounds relatively uh, realistic. I think. Okay, yeah, so, so mean, Mark was saying, it, it, you know, he, he wouldn't give up his driving. I would prefer to drive myself. Right. But I think a lot of people shouldn't be on the road to begin with, and computers can probably drive a lot better than they do. So uh, I think I welcome our new self-driving automotive future overlords <laughs> or something. Well, you know, I am part Borg now because I've got this little implant thing here. The, right? the, 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 the horrible news of the day about 20 minutes before we were due to go on air I was running around, I've got this little remote control that I'm supposed to hold up to my chest if anything goes wrong to record it I never lost it it's got my hospital details in it and everything and I think I've lost it so I've got to ring up the heart people tomorrow and go I'm really sorry I've lost the heart thing can you send me another one <laughs> but as for autonomous vehicles I would love to be driven uh, I love driving, don't get me wrong, but I would much rather, uh, I would look at it as a time-saving device. So if I'm if I'm driving somewhere, um, I can't be working. I can't be doing the stuff that I would mm. otherwise do with that time. And so very often for me, during the day, I have to drive a lot. You know, I have to drive to pick my kids up from school. And a lot of people have a, have a, have a moan at me for this, but the, because of family dynamics, my... Uh, my son goes to a school five miles away. My daughter goes to a school 10 miles further away. So my school run, my daily school run is more than an hour by the time you've factored in heavy traffic. So, and and there's no direct bus routes or whatever. So um, for me to get two hours of my day back would be wonderful because then I wouldn't have to work so late in the evening. So I, I'd use that for, the, for that reason. And then if I wanted to drive, and I do find driving relaxing and I enjoy driving, I would probably go uh, and, and drive, just go for a drive. Um, and now I'm going to say something I never thought I was going to say before. I tried Oculus Rift yesterday for the very first time in my life. Wow. My good friend uh, Adam has an Oculus Rift set up and he's really into flight sims and racing sims. Not like Xbox. We're talking full-blown you put the the headset on and you believe you are sitting behind the wheel of a high performance race car with the headphones and the 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 goggles on it's very difficult not to believe that you're not there i would i think let the car drive me in the real world and then if i wanted a, you know the adrenaline of driving a race car really quickly i'd go onto oculus rift is that sad mark <laughs> I don't know. It is it sad. Uh, I, I guess it's um, it, it. It may well be the way things are going to be. Yep. Uh, I <laughs> made you laugh, though, didn't I? Um, yes, all you right. Did. Okay, Daimler. I should make you laugh again now. Daimler's already always had problems with ED. Uh, the uh, um, electric drive. I'm laughing. Sorry. It's so bad. I was talking to Chelsea Sexton about this not so long ago, about how, you know, everybody that that knew what Daimler was going to do, Mercedes-Benz was going to do, and said, you really don't want to call that car the ED, the, the smart for two ED, uh, because it refers to a certain male problem. 
in America, which late night TV always tells us is a very common problem and there's a very simple cure and it normally involves lots of money. Um, but this week, Daimler said that they're going to change the way they name their vehicles. So instead of there being the ED or electric drive and the natural gas or, or, or all these long names, it's going to, to just use a single letter suffix to alternative fuel vehicles. So the gasoline vehicles won't get a suffix, but then there'll be, uh, I think it will be C for, 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 for compressed natural gas. And then there's a couple of other ones as well. What do you make of that, Dominic? Oh, he's gone again as well. What do you make of it, Mark? Oh, I don't care what they name these things. Do you, but I mean, I mean the plug-in the plug-in vehicles, they're going to change the way that the plug-in vehicles uh, are referred to. So instead of having um, an E, they're, sorry, instead of having electric drive and then plug-in hybrid, it's just going to be E. Well, you know, fine. I mean, I just suspect that there's a, a, a whole group of people who make way too much money convincing these car companies that uh, the, the letters are never the nomenclature they attach to these vehicles is is tremendously important and millions of dollars is wasted every year on on going through this stuff i couldn't care less <laughs> dominic can you still dominic can you hear us nope he can hear us but can you say anything <laughs> he's talking Working. It's not working at all. Uh, bear with me. This is embarrassing. Hopefully now if I press this button and I'm back in the studio, you should be able to see me. Um, I'm going to try and get Dominic back and we're going to rush through the rest of the stories for today because obviously some we've got some gremlins in the system and I don't know why things are going. All right, following on from a Q3 earnings call this week, uh, Tesla... Uh, CEO Elon Musk admitted, obviously that that, that was, sorry the earnings call was last week. Uh, Elon Musk admitted that that it's really difficult to make things well, lots of things well, intricate things well, and he had a great deal of respect for anyone, uh, which led us to yet another claim from someone saying Tesla should be purchased by Apple. Seriously, Mark. Well. You know, I must say, uh, you know, I, that doesn't strike me as a, a, such a terrible idea. Uh, I don't know uh, what all is involved. I suspect it's actually comments from people who don't understand the, the, what the details would be to do that. But, you know, I've, I had long ago thought Apple ought to uh, try and do something with cars uh, you know, with electric cars in particular, just electric cars, and that they might, you know, be able. To, but it's, you know, clearly, you know, the difference between an iPod and and the thing you might put your iPod in that takes you, yes. you know, yes. five hundred miles. Yes, is a world of difference, and I certainly wouldn't want to see Apple screwed up by a, a, a silly attempt to make cars. Yes, um, Dominic, what do you think of that? Nope. We can't hear you. Oh well. That's uh, that's so frustrating. That's so frustrating. We've got. I think we had this problem a couple of weeks back, and we need to uh, to try and get to the bottom of that particular gremlin. And I do apologise, Dominic. I think it's it's overheating. One of our bits of kit overheats, and then it just stops working properly. Uh, so I do apologise. All right. Um, let me just see where we got to. All right. <laughs> this is one you're going to love, Mark. Uh, Challenge Babendum this week in China. There was a presentation on hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. And uh, there was a chart in which, uh, and thanks to Autoblog Green for this, this great reporting from Autoblog Green, there was a chart in which um, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles were compared against you know, all of the other technologies. And they portrayed the range of electric vehicles as being really rather small and not making any improvements really to speak of in the next 10 20 years what's more it seems to completely ignore the existence of the tesla model s did you see this mark i didn't see it but it doesn't surprise me and i think that it's not an uncommon it's not uncommon i, I mean i've seen it at work even at the air resources board where you've got you know a fairly informed uh audience yet nonetheless because 99 percent of the folks don't know 
anything about any of this stuff. You can, you know, with a sophisticated or even simple PowerPoint presentation, convince people or at least cloud the issue. And so, uh, you know, a, that you could go in, into uh, in China or, or Philadelphia, for that matter, uh, and have a few people presenting on, on this stuff and say, look, electric cars don't go far enough. Well, I, you know, I'll, I'll tell a story. I recently was talking to someone who was who who I, I've who I'd been trying to get interested in a plug-in car, an electric car for for many many years. I just thought they were the right folks to get it. They could afford an early one, and uh, I thought they should get one. And so we were talking. They proudly came up to me to say, "Oh, we finally got a car. We got an yep. i three. Yep. We finally found a car that goes far enough to do what we want to do." And I said, "Are you talking about the the Rex? You know, with the oh no no, we didn't want the engine." We got it. It goes 80 miles. And I said, yeah, but, you know, the Leaf goes 80 miles. And she said, no, no, no. I, I, I know that the Leaf only goes 35 miles. I, I remember that was all it goes. And I was like, uh, you know, what are you talking about? And this is a person who is a full professor at a big university. I mean, you know, she is she's no dummy, I'll tell you. But but nonetheless, had convinced herself that the Leaf only went 35 or 40 miles. Um, you know, so I, I think, you know, perhaps she didn't like the way the Leaf looked and therefore um, was really waiting for some other type of car. But but people, you know, are persuadable that, that we are not where we're actually at. Um, it's part of the reason why I like that electric cars often are identifiable um, and different looking um, because it forces people to acknowledge their existence and I, I've got to tell you, I was recently interviewed and driving around town by Serbian television. And, you know, of course, there aren't a lot of electric cars in Belgrade, uh, but they were here doing a story on renewable energy and electric mm -hmm, cars. Mm -hmm. I was the electric car guy. And, you know, as we're driving around, I, I felt compelled to just point out every time I saw an electric car because they would never have noticed them. A Fiat just looks like a Fiat, you know, yeah, a Fit yeah. just looks like a Fit. Yeah. Uh, and a Tesla really just looks like another, you know, nice car. So you've got to point it out or people just don't, don't know what's yeah. actually happening right in front of their faces. Dominic, you're back yes. with us now, aren't you? Yes. In your Yay! <laughs> so um, this, this was something that, that your colleague uh, Seb brought up. He noted. Yes. Uh, yes. Isn't there not, um, is there not a duty among automakers to actually do some due diligence with this or, or or is it acceptable that they can kind of twist the truth apparently they feel it's acceptable to twist the truth i would looking at you're still talking about that chart with the range chart yeah, yeah. miles in some time far into the future yeah that's it's also crazy because they, they want they're really trying to push the the hydrogen thing for some reason and they put all so much money it's all it's really boggles my mind why they the whys and wherefores of them doing that? Yeah, the chart was is nuts. It is crazy. Because we we have that pretty much now. <laughs> it is absolutely crazy. All right, okay, let's move on to our final story of the day. It's our and finally, and I do apologise to anyone who's watching the show notes, watching through and going through the show and going, oh, we we kind of rushed that last bit. We rushed that last bit because the studio is falling apart around me. Dominic's machine keeps deciding it doesn't like me and my camera. Uh, we just keep pushing forwards. And finally, right, plug-in car drivers are often accused of vehicles being slow, boring golf carts. I'm going to show you this, which is plum quick. It's a golf cart, complete with uh, a set of nine irons on the back, going down the drag strip in South Carolina and setting a new world record. Quarter mile in 12 seconds, 12 point something seconds, terminal speed of 118, there you go, uh, 12.24 seconds, 118 miles per hour. That's brilliant, isn't it? That's just, that's just insane. Dominic, was this one of yours? I can't remember. Uh, no, nope, I didn't, I didn't cover it. I think Autoblog picked that up. They did they pick it up because we covered it from them and I just think it's just brilliant. Mark, that's one with a smile on your face. Absolutely. Maybe it would even get me interested in golf. <laughs> <laughs> Dominic, 
Now, if they made an off-road version, I really would be interested. That really is it for today's show. We're going to call a halt to proceedings there before anything else breaks. Thanks very much for joining us uh, today, Dominic. And I do apologise for the uh, audio problems we've been having. Where can people find out more about you and what you do? Uh, uh, they can follow me on Twitter at Dominic underscore Y and, and the Google Plus. Right. But mostly Google Plus I use just to um, put my uh, Autoblog Green links. Or you can find me on Autoblog Green, of course. Fantastic. And Mark, where can people find out more about you? Thank you for joining us. Uh, yes, I'm on Twitter at uh, Mark Geller. And uh, I do have a, an occasional blog at plugsandcars.blogspot.com. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for watching and listening at home. Don't forget you can find us on you can find us uh, on transportevolve.com every week. And you can also find us on your favourite podcast catching app, whether it be Apple's uh, own or somebody else's or Android or even Windows podcasting things. I've been told that Windows people do listen to podcasts. Do. Uh, it's great because you can listen to us in the car and if you're listening to the audio version you won't have known anything went wrong today really apart from me saying things are going wrong so maybe I should just shut up we'll be ne back next week at the usual time of 8pm UTC so 1800 hours sorry 8pm 6pm so 1800 hours UTC uh, that is 1pm if you are on the east coast of the US and it's 10am if you're on the west coast uh, so it's a Sunday Sunday afternoon or Sunday morning show for the Americans and if you're in Europe it's your Sunday evening show before you have to go to bed and start the week again. Thanks for joining us and as always folks don't forget to plug in. See you soon, take care, bye.